Good afternoon, uh, everybody. So as was just announced, I'm a biologist working at the laboratory of plant reproduction and development. Okay, I think I should launch my first slide. Okay. And uh, so I will not speak so much about my research today, but would rather like to speak about biology as a science more in general. So I think that most of you will have a very general, vague idea of what biology actually includes. Uh, and, well, there's actually no wonder, because if you look at a definition that you'll find in a normal dictionary, the science of life, well, this is a very general definition indeed. But this type of definition very nicely, accurately, summarizes the major challenge that we biologists as a community are facing. Hundreds of thousands of plants and animals to be studied, and every species coming with many questions meaning millions of questions that can potentially be asked. And very often, last but not least, very often only partial access to information. And as a result, we biologists very often have to be very general in our conclusions. It's not always possible to be very exact in our hypothesis. And um, a physicist and friend of mine uh, summarized this problem very nicely in a joke he told me about mainly biologists. He said, there's this um, biologist, physicist, and mathematician sitting in a train. They come along a field and they see a white cow. The biologist immediately says, oh, the cows are white here in this part of the country. The physicist said, well, hang on, hang on, there's only one white cow in a field. Up at which the mathematician says, well, you know, the only thing I see is a cow in a field, and the cow has at least one white side. And I think this very nicely summarizes the difference between these different sciences. Whereas mathematicians and physicists can be very precise, they can be quantitative in their experiments, very often biologists have to base their first hypothesis, their initial hypothesis, just on one or uh, two cows. I should have shown the answer. So, what solutions are there to solve that problem? Well, of course, uh, biologists have looked for solutions, and I'm not going to go into all the details. I won't have the time for that. However, I'd just like to make two points. First of all, the importance of model systems. At this moment, thousands of scientists are looking just at a limited number of uh, model systems, mice, the more plant Arabidopsis that I'm working on, uh, Drosophila, the fruit fly. And the idea is that by limiting our research to a limited number of species, we'll be able to uncover a number of basic principles that, at least we hope, will be applicable to a wide range of, uh, of, of species. The second point I would like to make, make is the importance of this article in 1953, uh, Nature, published this article by Watson and Crick, uh, unciphering the structure of DNA. And we discovered that the DNA can code for information and that this code can be transmitted from one cell to its daughters, from one generation to the other. And this has led to the general idea, and I'm sure that many of you will have this impression as well, that the DNA contains enough information to construct an entire organism. Um, to, present the, to present the concept, um, I like to show this picture uh, to my students. It's a painting by Magritte, a Belgian painter who called this painting Prévoyance, and indeed, knowing the species who laid this egg, well, it becomes possible to predict with a certain degree of precision what the bird is that will come out of, of it. However, uh, things are not uh, that always that simple. Um, whereas biotechnology uh, companies claim that they will be able to modify the, the genetic information in such a way that they will have custom designed crops, um, at the same time, uh, biologists have uncovered that. Uh, in fact, the DNA is not a simple computer program, as we sometimes think. Um, illustrated here by the next two examples, 
Here you see uh, flies, or it's just a general presentation of this result. The idea is that at higher temperature, the insects are smaller, yet they have exactly the same genetic information. So this means that the DNA, the genes, are not coding for the size of this animal. More extreme examples are seen if we look at uh, plants, for example. Uh, these, these plants, plants might have very close genetic information, or identical, yet, yet their shape, their architecture is completely different. And, and this is because they interact during their development and have to adapt to uh, the, uh, the, the, their environment. And if our beta would have been in front of a uh, seed, for example, uh, even knowing the species, well, he would not have been able to predict with any sort of precision the precise architecture of the plant coming out of this seed. So, why is this? What, what, what is wrong with our hypothesis that the DNA is a kind of rigid computer program? Well, slowly, we biologists are starting to realize that, in fact, uh, living systems are not computers, but they are what we call complex systems. Now, what is a complex system? A complex system is an, a system uh, composed of many elements which interact according to, very often, but not always, simple rules. And these systems have a sort of collective behavior. Uh, and this collective behavior cannot be identified readily just when you look at the individual parts. Um, sometimes, and maybe you know this expression, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. In other words, non-linear behavior of these systems. Uh, now, complex systems are not limited just to uh, biology. There's many examples, human societies, uh, the economy, uh, the internet, of course. Millions, billions of computers connected to each other. Nobody really decides what the structure of that network is. Uh, the economy. And, well, as I just said, we have this collective uh, behavior. Uh, we call that emergent property. So, the properties emerge from this, this local behavior. And these emergent properties are really a basic property of, uh, of complex systems. Um, just to illustrate again, uh, using this time an, uh, an example from the stock market, at the local level, there's these hundreds of traders, and they have, uh, well, you could say one big drive, they want to become very rich. And as a result, every single company that is registered in that particular stock market will have a very precise value. Nobody decides what that value is going to be. Not even collectively, they're not deciding it. It's just a result of their collective behavior. And in this sense, uh, complex systems are very different from other complicated systems, such as a clock, for instance. You hope that the clock, while well, there's many interacting elements, will not have too many emergent properties. You just want the clock to indicate very precisely the, the, the time. And, well, all this to say that living systems are also complex systems. Billions of molecules interact with each other to form cells. These cells have properties that you can never predict just by looking at the parts. The cells interact to form tissues, the tissues organs, and finally the organs, in this case, form an entire plant. Um, and actually, this doesn't go one way. It's not from molecules to plant. No. Um, the plant as a whole will interact with its environment, and this will then feed back to the molecular networks. So we really have uh, systems that have to be studied and analyzed at multiple scales. Okay, well, I already said it. Um, how do you um, approach this type of systems? Again, it's difficult to be exhaustive. But the idea is, first of all, to identify the components. This is what we have been doing over the last 30 years. Uh, because the DNA is coding for many of these components. But we also have to characterize their interactions. We have to identify the emergent properties um, to analyze these systems at uh, different scales. And very importantly, we have to be extremely precise in our uh, observations and our measurements. So you might now think, well, you know, they don't really have solved their problem. First they had uh, maybe a million of species, and now every species has millions of molecules and whatever. So, you know, 
more than back to square one. However, I think we can be optimistic. This is because, first of all, we limit most of our research to a limited number of model species, as I just said. And secondly, the technology has evolved in a really spectacular manner. It's now possible to sequence the DNA of an individual in hours. Uh, the analysis might take more time, but we have very powerful computer to analyze this information. We have very powerful and sophisticated microscopes to, in, to, to study the interactions between uh, a molecule and between molecules. And as a result, I think, as I just said, we can be optimistic and quite confident that if in 30 years again this biologist is sitting with a physicist and a mathematician, you'll be able to say, well, did you know that 95.9% .9 of the cows are white? And in addition, you'll also be able to explain how the cow became white and even why it is there. And with this uh, optimistic message, I would like to end my presentation and to thank you for your attention. Thanks.